Good morning. Thank you for tuning in to Voice of Reason Boston on WEZE 590. Today we're going to be talking about domestic violence and we have someone in the community who is an act, a, activist. Um, she's an advocate. She's everything. She's a director of AFAB Association of Haitian Women of Boston and she's just going to be giving us information uh, on what she's doing in the community, um, services that her her um, organization provides. Um, she's going to be telling us everything that she does in order to make people aware about the domestic violence epidemic because it is rapidly um, still going on. Um, nothing has been changed, but there is programs out there. Uh, we are uh, making progress, but it's still there where people are being abused on a daily basis. Uh, good morning, Carmel. How are you? Good morning, Tamisha. I thank you for inviting me to the Voice of Reason of Boston, mm -hmm. and it's my first time, and hopefully it's not going to be the last. Absolutely not. And we are going to talk today about uh, uh, domestic violence, and uh, I am also the Domestic Violence Program Director at the Association of Haitian Women in Boston, AFAB. Thank you. And can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, how you got involved um, with, you know, being so passionate, not how you got involved with the program, and as as well as how um, what made you so passionate about domestic violence? Oh, I can say that domestic violence like can't find me. I really didn't find domestic violence to mm -hmm. work with, uh, in the in the field. Okay. My first uh, my background is business administration. I was living in Canada. I first moved to Boston in 1986, and one of my job when I moved to uh, to Boston was to teach GED in French at Wilkes-Barre Community College. And at that time, I realized that most of the students at the school, um, they have some domestic, they had some domestic violence issue that they mm -hmm. had to deal with. And there was nothing that I could do because even myself at that time, I didn't know much about domestic violence. Right. And after a while, I volunteer to work at AFAB as the uh, Haitian Creole uh, literacy teacher. I did it as a volunteer for a year. So I, while I was there, I realized again that most of the students in the classroom were also victims of domestic violence. At some point, I said, whoa, there is something going on because it's like that domestic violence is following me wherever I go. Mm -hmm. So by in, at some point, we started having some grant at AFA, and Caroline, who is the executive director of the Association of Asian Women in Boston, offered me if I want to take the position as an advocate to work with domestic violence. Right. And it was a shock to me because I know what am I going to do because I don't know anything about domestic violence at that time. And I can say I was fortunate enough to be surrounded by a group of wonderful women mm -hmm. that, uh, I mean, that can say that pa paved the way for me mm -hmm. to, to get involved. And I started attending different trainings and that's how I start with a uh, domestic violence, and I've been doing it for over like 15 years. Wow, that's a long time. Uh, close to 20. I'm actually, I've been at AFAB for 20 years, but as a domestic violence director, I think probably 15 years. Okay, wow, that's and I that's never, a long time. I never regret it one day. That's good. And you, we all know that in the Haitian community, uh, domestic violence is silent. Um, oftentimes, women stay in relationship, and even men. Uh, they stay in uh, relationships because of their children, um, because they're afraid of what people would say, or this is the only thing that they know the person that they're with. What, what kind of educational program w did you kind of cater to these people who were um, facing domestic violence and being able to provide them resources? Because oftentimes um, these are women who's just coming from Haiti and they have no family, only the man that just brought them into the country. Yeah, there is no doubt about it that domestic violence is still prevalent in the community. And just to say that it's not just the Haitian community, it's something, it's a global uh, issue. It's not only Haitian. But the problem is, is us as Haitian, how are we dealing with it? Right. Because it's still taboo in our community. No one wants to talk about it. 
and even the victim most of the time they will come to see you they start talking to you about their uh, priorities need for example I don't have a place to stay. Right. They will talk to you about the housing issues. They will talk about the health issues. They will talk about the immigration issues before mm -hmm. they start talking about the domestic, domestic violence. violence. It's yeah. like they put it in the back burner, but everything else is much more important. But the abuse that they are dealing with, they're trying to kind of sometimes put it under the wall but, and try to deal with the other issues that to them that more present than the domestic violence issue. That is, that is true. Um, oftentimes, you know, Haitian women, they suppress the real issue because they're afraid about where they're going to sleep, um, where they're going, about going back home, um, and that is something that needs to be talked about, and we will continue to talk about it today. For those people who are first tuning in um, and they're wondering, what is a Association of Haitian Women of Boston? Where are you guys located? Um, what do you do in the community? Um, not only do you help domestic violence women, but what resources, where do you send them when they're having issues that is too greater for you to even help them with? Uh, what we do uh, in terms of, uh, we, the way we tackle the problem of domestic violence at half Farm is to education and prevention okay. and also intervention. Because we say, say with the woman, if you want to, to uh, persecute your, your, persecu your abuser, you have the right to do so. And like you said in the beginning, domestic violence is not only it's not a gender issue. No, it's and, not. and we do have some men also that are a victim of domestic violence, but the majority of the client that we have been uh, dealing with mm -hmm. are, hey, hey, are women. And back in the in 1999, we did a preliminary need assessment to see how prevalent that the problem of domestic violence was in the community, and. According to to the people who responded to that to, to the survey that we put out there, like over fifty percent of them said that domestic violence was like a crisis in the community. Right. And I uh, I have been fortunate enough to be part of the domestic violence uh, council uh, under uh, Governor uh, Mitt Romney for four years. I was the uh, domestic violence commissioner for immigrants and refugees, and I was representing, of course, the Haitian uh, the Haitian community because I have until today is the only Haitian organization that are really dealing with the issue of domestic violence. And I was fortunate enough to learn from the other ethnic group that are dealing with domestic violence mm -hmm. and the way we as Haitian are dealing with it. Uh, for example, I can, uh, for example, the Somali community, sometimes even the, the consulate, they get involved for all the new immigrants that come from Somali okay. to do education and prevention for them before they get to the, the when they start in this country because there is no such thing as domestic violence back home. Right. So when they come over here, they have to learn what domestic violence is all about. So also that prevent them also to do it here because they have been trouble, they can be deported because domestic violence is a deportable offense. Yes, it is. And most of immigrants when they come over here, they don't know about that. They take whatever they used to do in back home in their home country. When they come over here, it's they can okay. still they can still co uh, doing it because it was accepted where they, uh, they are from, and nobody was talking about it, and there was no law against it where they are coming from. But I think as immigrants, we we need to keep on the fight because uh, AFAB was created in 1988 as a voice for women in in, in Boston, and I think until today the community still need that voice mm -hmm. to talk on behalf of the woman in terms of domestic violence and everything else. Um, do you, I know you were working under, you said, um, what's the governor's name at the time? Uh, Romney. Romney, Governor Romney. Now, is there anyone that you know that's working with the current um, government, uh, Governor Baker uh, in, in regards to the Haitian um, domestic violence community? Actually, I don't know if uh, they have a council because okay. I know they have it on, on the Governor Romney and they have it on the, the next one, on the Governor uh, a, 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 a Patrick Devon. Okay. They still have the council on domestic violence, but for me, for Baker, Baker, I really don't know. I'm not sure. Well, that's something we should definitely take a in look the into. If there is one, we are not invited. Governor Baker, if you're listening to this, uh, we definitely need, uh, you know, for you to help us get involved 
um, in regards to the Haitian Council for Domestic Violence so that we can try to educate more people and not only just Haitian women but other women who's coming from different countries um, to reduce the domestic violence uh, um, issue that is going on in our community and not and that will also help us to help the children that they are taking care of um, help them better from not experiencing what domestic violence is and it, it, and it takes a lot of work it's not something that can be done overnight but as we prepare and move forward we have a lot of people that are running for um, candidacy now for um, different districts and different positions in the government uh, but domestic violence we cannot forget dom domestic violence and what we can do to reduce the increase because every day you go to court you hear you know domestic violence is one of the charges that people are facing on a daily basis. And according to the Department of Public Health, uh, immigrant women are three times more likely to die from due to domestic violence than people born in this country. And there is no prevention. So, yeah, it's not something that we really can take lightly at, as a immigrant because mm -hmm. we, are, and we are the victim. Yes. Um, also, uh, we have dif d domestic violence. It comes in all shapes and sizes. Um, it comes in different races. Um, what are some of the domestic violences that people suffer? Um, it could be mental. It could be physical. Physical, if, if for example, that's what we see. Mm -hmm. We can see, but it could be deeper than that. It could be emotional. It could be mental. It could be economy. And as immigrants, I don't know how many immigrant women or men that got that because of that green card that they are waiting from their partner, that they are dealing with domestic violence for years, waiting for that green card right so it could be a sexual it could be it comes with different form it could be mental physical um, em emotional emotional financial financial where someone is always when you go to work you have to give them the check and then they control you based on what you are doing with the money um, physical could be you know we know bodily harm pushing hitting any body contact and then mental abusing you mental calling you out of your name um, saying things you're not worth it on a daily basis and all these types of domestic fight um, domestic violences um, are are happening and people are not saying anything because they are afraid and I think it's good to have organizations like AFAB to continue to do the work that they do because uh, women need it now when some when a woman comes in what is the intake process how do you go about doing, uh, evaluating their cause or their problem um, in order to help them in the right direction? What we do, we always do an assessment, an initial assessment when we have a client for the first time. And the problem is, uh, most of our clients, we work really very closely with the Boston Police Department. And I can say that we, over the years, we have really a great relationship with the Boston Public, uh, Boston uh, Police Department. And most of the time, they refer the client to us. Okay. Us, the court system refer the client to us. We have DTA that sometimes they refer the client to us also, DTA, DCF, to work with them. Uh, so by the time they get to us, sometimes the process is already started. Okay. So we just have to continue on with the process. But if they have not been to the process, for example, sometimes we got a client coming from out of state, mm -hmm. even out of the country, because we have a few women coming from Canada, from Africa, fleeing domestic violence that end up at AFA. So we have to start the process. And what we do, we help the, cl the client from A to Z. If the client need legal representation, we work with a few legal services in Boston where we can refer our client. In the past, we used to have a lawyer on site where when the client get there, we don't have to refer the client because the lawyer is already there. But now, because of funding cut, we have to refer them out. We work with a lot of great uh, legal services, for example, like Casamiana, like uh, Greater Boston Legal Services, Classic in Cambridge. We, uh, Northeastern University, Harvard University. We work with those uh, legal services in order to help the client. And a lot of them come over here also on a fiancé visa, and right. you know the process. When they come here on a fiancé visa, you got in, uh, 90 days to get married. And most of the time, the domestic violence started before the 90 days, so they never get married. They come here legally, 
and they end up not being illegal in mm -hmm. this country because of the fiancé visa and the other partner didn't, I don't know, respect the bag, the, 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 his word or her word when they, they, they want to bring the person here. And also what we realize also, some people are multiple offenders in the sense that you can have a, one abuser that got three, four women mm. coming to the organization for the same service, right. but it's the same abuser. So that's when there's a pattern. He will come with a, go to Haiti, get the woman, bring the woman here. Next thing you know, thing didn't work out. He went back to Haiti, get divorced this one here, go back to Haiti, get another one, bring them here. So this has to stop. Right. Can you tell us the core values and the mission for Association of Haitian Women of Boston? The mission of SAFAB is to empower women and girls in, to give, by giving them the tool, the necessary tool that they need mm -hmm. in order for them to, uh, to be uh, individual and co to, uh, uh, in order for them to really uh, effect change in the country where they are living. And our core value is the same thing. We have to uplift the girls and the women uh, by, by telling them their right and demystify the stereotype that we got from Haitian women. Mm -hmm. Tell them what they, what they can do, what they cannot do, and sh let them know their rights and there is things that they can do. For example, like voting right. When you are in this country, your vote count. Even when back home, your vote didn't have any value. value but when you are here, your vote do count. So it's an ongoing process that we help people get their citizenship, we help them register to vote, and we also sometimes do some workshop with them and tell them about what to look when you got a candidate, what to look in the, in the candidate, mm -hmm. because you cannot just waste your vote like that. You, you have to know why you are voting and for who you are voting. That's good because these tools are very important for them to, especially coming into a country that they're not even familiar with. So preparing them and giving these tools that will help them not only for today but for the upcoming future that they're uh, moving to stay or going forward into um, moving forward into wherever they may go. Like say if they come to Boston and Boston is and they're running away from Boston because the abusers still looking for them if they go to say New York, New Jersey or Atlanta they still have these necessary tools that your organization has helped them to move forward within their life. And sometimes they don't know that they can change completely their identity. If you don't want your abuser to find you, right. there is a way you, that you can go to change for example you start by your social security, mm -hmm. you change your name, you change your kids a uh, social security, the abuser won't be able to find you if you don't make a mistake or people uh, 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 by telling mm -hmm. somebody or a friend that you think that is a friend by telling them your situation they won't be able to find you. Yes that's true. Um, also um, can you tell us you do have advocates that work in your organization what are you, the roles of the advocate that works alongside of you? We have an advocate that works on a part-time basis at Dorchester Court. And a role at Dorchester Court is to help a, any client that works in the, in the court, a, in the district court, mm -hmm. to navigate the system. Because when you send an immigrant, new immigrant, to sometimes the people cannot, it doesn't have to be a new immigrant, but uh, they don't know anything about the system. Right. You go to court to get a restraining order. So the advocate is there to help them navigate the system, mm -hmm. to explain to them what's a restraining order. In the past, I had clients that went to court to get a restraining order, but by the time they get out and they tell them that the, the partner is not going to be able to come home tonight, right. and they come back to the office start crying right. because they didn't know what they get themselves into. So the uh, advocate role at the uh, at Dutch DC Court is to help any client, specifically Haitian, to navigate the system and help them when they need a receiving order and help them. And you know also when you get a receiving order that the mm -hmm. time that you are more in danger and to be able to follow up with the client and make sure that everything is okay uh, at the beginning because that's, that's when the, the client is more in danger when you first got a receiving order. Yeah, and we can go back. We've, we've worked together in a couple of past years and that brings me to um, what you're saying now, how when I was working for the district attorney's office, when I started off 
in in Dorchester went off to uh, Roxbury Superior Court how our relationship grew because you would send some of these Haitian women to me to translate to help them understand what the restrain, restraining order is and to be able to um, help them and translate in front of the judge to let them know why they are seeking the restraining order what is going on because oftentimes when they go into the court they don't know if if you don't understand Haitian Creole you will not be able to understand how to help this person get the restraining order. And we know restraining order is very important. It's not only just a piece of paper, because a lot of people treat it that way, but it, it is very important for people to understand that if someone violates the restraining order, they can be held on um, violating that restraining order. So that brings back to me how you would send these people and it's refreshing to see once they understand what it's all about what they're doing um how how important it is we need haitian advocates um in all different yeah, boston the court, the different yeah. courts because we all know when you go to court you don't have an interpreter it's difficult for the judge to understand what's going on and what needs are you looking for to get help? Sometimes it's not even the interpreter, it's just the system. Mm -hmm. You got the woman walk into the courthouse, the person emotionally freezes off. Mm -hmm. And whatever language that the person used to, uh, used to speak, it's like the person cannot speak. And I have people who come here when they were seven, eight years old that speak English fluently. Right. But by the time they go to court in front of the judge, they could not put a sentence together. Mm -hmm. And also at the same time that we were helping the victim, but the defendant also doesn't know anything about domestic violence, uh, 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 domestic violence or the system, not the domestic violence, but, but the system. The system. And when you tell them that if you do this, you are going to violate the receiving order, but you have to spell it out to them. Right. It, they don't know anything about it. The, the country where they are coming from, they didn't have a receiving mm. order over there. So and in the past, I know the court used to have an advocate that's used to work specifically with the defendant to explain to them what the, their rights are and how they can really stay away from the victim mm -hmm. in order for them not to get into trouble. But now there is nobody. So you got a receiving order, you got two people. You get the receiving order to the woman thinking that the woman is safe, but the partner doesn't even know what's what's in that restraining order, what the restraining order means, mm -hmm. and the restraining order also is a, different, it's a deportable offense if they violated it, but somebody needs to explain it, it's spell it out to them. They don't know anything about it. And another thing is too, Boston is so small, the Haitian community, almost everybody knows someone in the Haitian community, and you have that other problem where the woman is afraid to even tell someone that they need help because they're afraid someone else will go back and tell the abuser and not only that sometimes you find yourself interpreting both for the defendant and, and the, both the uh, for the abuser i mean both for the for the abuser yeah, and the victim. the victim and i don't think that's fair no. um to the victim nor to the abuser because the abu abuser needs to understand what they are doing wrong and why it, it what they're doing um can cause a lot of trouble and the abuser needs to understand I mean the uh, victim I'm getting them all mixed up the victim needs to understand what her rights are because victims have Our rights, rights. Yeah. and a lot of victims don't, don't know, know. The, don't know their rights even sometimes when they are leaving the courthouse they don't know that you can make sure that they detain the defendant for a while mm -hmm. make sure you are completely out of, of the courthouse uh, right. before they let him out Sometimes also they can come to the back door mm -hmm. instead of coming to the front door. But if you have an advocate working with you, they can help you really, really deal and navigate to the system to know really what to get the better service that you need for that time at that time. And and those are the things that we need to continue to talk about because there's still a lot of a lot of group of women that don't know the process, the criminal process, uh, what to expect, their rights, and to speak up because yeah. once it's violated, some of them don't, don't even know to call the police once the restraining order no, is, vi is violated. It's break, my, it's break my heart when I got a client that will be coming to see me after like, oh, I've been in that situation for 10 years, for 12 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. They didn't know that 
they can have a better life. Mm -hmm. You don't have to stay in that relationship. There is a lot of things that you can do, but don't do it yourself. And also, we also, also tell people that if you don't know anything about the, uh, domestic violence, please don't give advice to advice, people. Exactly. Because most of the time, they're not giving them the wrong yeah. advice. Like, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago when we have that woman in Boston, she had a restraining order. Apparently, she went to church and her pastor told her that you have to remove that restraining order. Right. She removed the restraining order on Wednesday. She died on Thursday. So when you are looking for help, it's best to find out the real the best way yeah. to get your help and sometimes for I don't know if people are not comfortable as Asian if you're not comfortable if you're not comfortable to get services from us I'll refer you out mm -hmm. because there's other places in Boston that really help victims of domestic violence it doesn't have to be us speaking of churches I know you are a woman of faith you're strong in your faith and you're very active in your church um, how important is it for the church, the pastor, to interact with their con congregation about domestic violence and to help women who are facing domestic violence to help them heal and be able to help them move forward. Because you know, you know, they we we have the Bible. Um, sometimes the men are, are are abusing the women, but they still have leadership positions in the church. How important is it for us to continue to have this conversation um, with pastors and going to churches and educating them? Because oftentimes the pastors don't even know how to tackle the issue of domestic violence. I am, a, I am happy to say that over the years we, we cultivate a relationship with the clergy in, in the Boston area. Yeah, but you have a clergy breakfast. We that you have been do. doing a clergy breakfast since 1999. So every year we have a big breakfast. We invite all the clergy in the community, Catholic, Protestant, to sit down at the table so we can deal with the problem of domestic violence that they are facing at their churches. We don't have to ask them, do you have any domestic violence at your church? We know so. Mm -hmm. So the problem is now how to deal with it. And the first one, I remember the first one that we did back 1999 or 2000, we had probably like seven or eight right. pastors. Mm -hmm. And the one that we had last year, I think we had 41. It's, and the yeah. one before, I think we had 40. So the, the number keep going. It's becoming like a tradition in the community. Even sometimes when I'm out, pastor will say, come when is the next clergy breakfast? Right. And I heard about the clergy breakfast. When are you going to invite me? I didn't get an invitation this mm -hmm. year. But the the good thing uh, in that uh, by working with the pastors at the church, we have you have the men, you have the women, you have the kids. So you can kill three birds right. with one stone. Uh, we can do workshop. That's what we do. And most of the time, the pastor themselves invite us to come over and do workshop at the churches where we can talk about the problem and how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. As pastor, I can understand sometimes they don't want to get involved right. for many reasons. And one of the uh, examples that I can give, I remember one of the pastors he was helping a woman because of his, a domestic violence a situation. And next thing you know, the, uh, the guy went to one of the Asian radio and said that the pastor is having an affair with his wife. Wow. So those kind of situations, they don't want to get involved most of the time for that mm -hmm. reason. And sometimes also it's a, still the power struggle is in the church. The man is the powerful one at the church. The man is the one who has a leadership position at the church. Mm -hmm. So of course, the pastor has a tendency most of the time to not to, I mean, to see them on an equal a pedestal mm -hmm. and one of the sto another story is one of the situation that we faced when I remember there was one woman a there was she was having an argument with her husband and next thing you know the fight broke out and the woman the woman broke her arm but the guy mm -hmm. the husband broke her arm so the next Sunday she went to church she was singing in the cho choir she put a woman with her arm still uh, bended to sing in the choir. And the pastor said, no, people who, who call the police on their husband cannot sing in the choir. But the husband was a deacon at the church. 
he was giving communion that same Sunday. No, that's sad. And the woman wasn't even the one that called the police. A neighbor called the police. And the police get in the woman, the guy get arrested. But that's the way most of the, some of them, they used to deal with it. Mm -hmm. But I can say we make a lot of progress. Yeah, we have progress of educating yeah. them. And now I can say that most of them, they know better. I think it's very important for these tools to be continued, to be implemented um, in churches, not only in Haitian churches, Hispanic churches, Muslim churches, every different ethnic church because they all have their own domestic violence. Mm -hmm. um, we're not where we used to be. Um, I know that I've been able to attend the Clara G breakfast almost every year. Um, and it's a wonderful thing to see how many people um, are coming out and wanting to learn. And, and the how question that they're asking also, sometimes it's really surprising. Mm -hmm. oh. And it's important for our pastor is not only to, I always say, if there's no family, there's no church. If there's no church, there is no family. So it is important when there is someone in the church that is facing domestic violence, it not only impacts the mother and the father, it the also impacts the, the children. And, the community. and we know the children are the ones that's coming behind. And if the church is not doing anything, the children will get up and be like, why go to church? You know? Things are not working at home. And the Bible says, me and my family, we will serve the, the Lord. Lord. So it's, it's important to have that. And I know that we have pastors that come out in the community. What kind of pastors that come in? And who do you come in to talk about domestic violence in the clergy breakfast? Oh, some of them have been supporting us for the past, like, tw almost 20 years that we have been doing it. We got... Pastor Solini Vedrin, mm -hmm. it's one of them. Pastor, uh, the late Pastor Lawash, mm -hmm. he no longer there with us. We got past, oh, we got another one, Pastor uh, Colbert Callis was one also that he, he never missed one of the clergy breakfast, but unfortunately he passed away last week. We got Pastor Michel Louis, we got Pastor Thomas St. Louis. I don't want to start Pastor Dumoni, <laughs> both Dumonis. Pa uh, there are so many of them. Right. I don't want to pass to uh, Ricardo Bonacci, pass to uh, Bishop Nicola, pass mm -hmm. to uh, Florice. So many of them, they are very supportive of the, the of the clergy mm. breakfast. And actually, they always ask to have more than one in a year. But it's a lot of work. It is a lot of work, especially if you're not getting the support yeah. that it's, you need. It's a lot of work. And even by chasing them, to invite them, to make sure that they are there, it's a lot of work. Uh, but... Um, now, I know you've named some of the pastors that that attends. Now, are they only Christians, Catholics? What kind of denomination no, do you... No, we got the Father Miracle, Father Mirac. Mm -hmm. Father Mirac is one of them. Used to so be he's there. Catholic. He's Catholic. He's there. There, is a past, there is also a, a Catholic priest in New Jersey that uh, came last year. Mm -hmm. uh, we used to have another pa a, a Catholic... I know Pastor Bonneville came once when we did it... Uh, Father Bonneville, he came once when he did it in Boston, mm -hmm. at once. What we used to do in the past, we used to rotate the clergy breakfast. Every year we do it at a different place. Okay. One year in Boston, one year in Cambridge, one year in Manhattan, so one year in Rochester, cities different in cities, in different churches, because we used to do it at the church. Mm -hmm. But what we realized, I said, if you want to be neutral, yeah. if you are inviting different faith, so we have to be neutral. It cannot be a church. Right. So we start doing it at the Manapen Library, and that's where we have been for the past six or seven years. And who are the guest speakers that come? We know we have pastors, but we also have guest speakers. Oh, we got different guest speakers. Uh, we got pastors. Actually, this year, uh, this past year, we had the Reverend Daphne uh, Daphnis. Mm -hmm. Actually, he called. I talked to him not long ago. He said it was so uh, something that he didn't see before. But after he did it for us, he decided to implement it in church. So he had a big event on domestic violence two Sundays ago at wow. the church. We have a Judge Tyne yes, last judge year. Yes, Judge Tyne last uh, year. He did a good job. We have a Dr. Anne, uh, also at Dorchester Court, to the clinical uh, mm -hmm. psychiatric at Dorchester Court. We have different pastors, women and men pastors coming. Uh, we have a... Chaplain Gary Adams okay. from the Boston Police Department. He did a wonderful job for us a couple of years ago. We got so many. Every year we got a different. Sometimes we got we used to have workshop, mm -hmm. but now we got a different uh, setting. We just have a keynote speaker or two keynote speakers to come, and we got uh, survivors 
coming and tell the stories. That's very powerful. Yeah, it is. And because pastor will say, no, I heard about domestic violence all the time, but I never see the faces mm -hmm. of, uh, behind the domestic violence issue that we have been talking about. So every year now we try to get one survivors to come and tell the stories. Also, we have, I know you have, I said we, but I, I, I know because I'm part of it. You have a round table. Um, we try to do it every Tuesday. Um, and can you explain to our uh, listeners and people who are tuning in on Facebook uh, what does the round table consist of? Who, who are there to come to the round table and what you talk about every Tuesday? It's one every Tuesday, Wednesday. Um, every Wednesday of the month. The AFAB is one of the co-founders of the Roundtable. The Roundtable was uh, founded in 1999. Mm -hmm. At that time, we had a grant uh, from the Department of Public Health. We founded the Roundtable with three other organizations. It was, at that time, Transition House, HAFI, and Haitian Coalition in Somerville. And the grant was for, like, three years. But after three years, AFAB still keep mm -hmm. the Roundtable. And uh, it's a wonderful thing in this sense because we got the coalition. Uh, the Roundtable is a coalition of different agencies yes. dealing with domestic violence mm -hmm. in the community. So we meet every first Wednesday of the month at AFAB, which the address is 330 Fuller Street. So everybody who are working who was listening right now and that's working in the field. So you are invited. It's every first Wednesday of the month. We meet from 10 to 11.30 at AFAB, 3.30 Fuller Street in Dorchester. And that's any agency? Any agency that work with domestic violence, violence. somehow. Okay. And if I start, I can give you a partial list of people who are at the table because there is <laughs> no way I remember. When we started the round table, we probably got like, like I said, four agencies founded the round table. But now we got like close to 35, between 35 and 40 That's organizations excellent. part excellent. of the round table. Even though they are not at the round table every month, but they keep holding it. If you don't mm -hmm. see them this month, next They'll month you will, the you will see month. them. So we got close to 40 different organizations at the table. We got Boston Police Department. I think we got four advocates from the Boston Police we got C11, we got B3, E18, and we got two advocates at C11. We got DTA, we got people from DCF, we got people from uh, BARC, Boston Area Rape Crisis Center. We got all the Haitian community based organizations. We have a Wazi's place. We, we have some hospital, like uh, there's somebody from Brigham and Women Hospital attending the, the workshop, the mm -hmm. clinic in the area, like. Godman Square Health Center. I know I represented it, the district attorney's office the for a couple yeah, of years. The DA's office. We have somebody from the DA's office. We have uh, people from Harvard Neighborhood Health Center, mm -hmm. Manapen Health Center, a home for little wanderers. We have oh Lord, it's so many that I cannot remember. If I miss somebody, please. We got Dove, we Dove, one of the yeah. leading organizations dealing with Phoenix the Phoenix House. We got Phoenix House. It's a lot of, it's great, and the, the reason that I said it's really great, I think that was the most powerful tool that we got to deal yes. with domestic violence in the community, because when we need something, we made a phone call, but we know who we are talking mm -hmm. to. So, for example, if I need something at the Boston Police Department, C-11 or B-3, I don't have to go there. Right, I don't have to have send an advocate there. Mm -hmm. It's like the person that are at the round table is already there representing the whole community. I just have to send my client and say that so this and is so, the person. This somebody from AFAB, and I make a phone call and I said, okay, I'm sending somebody at 10 o'clock, at 11 o'clock, please do what you can for me. If I need something, if I need the background on something, somebody mm -hmm. that's going on at the courthouse, I know who to call and I know who to talk to. One of the things that I admire and I love about the ROM table when I've attended was how we have all these powerful women that are, whether you're well known in your organization or not, we can collaborate together. If we have an issue, yeah. we bring the issue forward and each person in that round table gives an opinion on how to tackle or help this individual with the domestic violence issue. And believe it or not, by the end of the month, well, we, got a result. we have a result for yeah. it. So that's one of the importance of having the, your organization and roundtables, people from different agencies in the community collaborating and helping one another to um, stop the domestic violence epidemic that is going on now. Um, and I think, you know, we're, like I said, 
where we were, we're not there now. No. We, that still we still have, we still, have we when, still when we definitely do. have work to yeah. do. Um, Sometimes we, when we got some difficult uh, cases, mm -hmm. we just do a case study. We brought the, uh, the study, uh, the case to the round table, and every single organization decided, okay, I'm going to do this, I'm yes. going to do that. And by the end of the day, we already got a plan for we the have client. A resolution. Yeah. Um, we can continue to talk about this all day, but time is not our friend now. <laughs> um, but can you tell us uh, what's, you have an event coming up, and I would like you to tell us a little bit more about the event and give us all your information online where people can go and talk to you via email or call you on the phone. I know your phone's going to be ringing by Monday, but um, I know you have an event coming up. Look, can we you share that with us? We have two events coming up. Yes. Okay, we, the, the first event is going to be our annual Domestic Violence Prevention Forum, mm -hmm. and it's going to be on October 3rd. October 3rd. October 3rd is a Wednesday. It's going to be in the afternoon from 5 to 8 p.m. Mm -hmm. It's going to be at Kaipam, which is located at 6 Livingston Street, in Dorchester. For people who know the area is almost across the Boston Police Department on Morton Street. And for Haitian people, it's behind Bon Appetit Restaurant. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to find and there is plenty of parking. We are going to have a keynote speaker. Actually, she is a woman from Haiti. She used to work in an organization in Haiti. She has not been in this country for a long time. But uh, believe it or not, whatever she used to deal with in Haiti, that's the same thing that we are dealing here with Haitian women mm -hmm. here in Boston. And it's important to share So that. she's going to mostly focus on sexual assault that women are facing in Haiti. And she is going to be our keynote speaker. And after that, we are going to break to, into workshops. We have four different workshops. One of them is going to be a workshop on TPS. TPS, what next? Usually we do TPS. Um, TPS is going to end. And uh, domestic violence is one. One, yeah. Um, TPS, domestic violence, and um, I want to say uh, immigration. Yeah, because this, there is a connection. Mm -hmm. Because, uh, you know, when our VAWA, I, with the new administration, VAWA is going to end, actually ended September. Right. So, no, September 30th, VAWA is going to end. So we need to get prepared for that. And I know housing was one of the major ones. Last year? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the TPS is because TPS is ended. And of course, a lot of people keep calling. They don't know what to do, what's going to happen, what's next. And most of the, those people, uh, TPS recipients, they're also domestic violence victims. Yeah, I remember sitting down with um, Milana from yeah, Phoenix right, House. Yeah which is she's an attorney for uh, a domestic violence shelter and she was helping and answering questions to victims and people who had questions about TPS and by the end of the night we yeah. had a long list of people we were going through their application That's to see who exactly we can help. That's exactly the dilemma that we are facing right now. Do we do the TPS workshop separately or we put it as a breakout workshop? Mm -hmm. Because I don't, it, more, almost everyone in the room would want to know more about TPS. Absolutely. What to do. Because the team this year for for forum mm -hmm. is post me too movement what next for survivors right so everybody keep hearing about the me too movement the me too movement what's next we are there now we know now what's have been going on in this country or all over the world for mm -hmm. years but now what next what do we do with the, the survivors we are going to have one workshop also on teen and domestic abuse okay because you know most of the teen they are they are in relationship but their parents don't know that they are in a relationship. Mm. And sometimes there is abuse. And because of technology right now, the abuse most of the time is taking different form that we are not ready to deal with. Yeah. Sharing pictures. Like sexting, mm -hmm. text sexting. So uh, those kind of things, there will be some uh, two uh, people from, from, uh, from Dove that will be coming and do that workshop on teen dating violence. There will uh, there'll be also another workshop on first responders. For example, when you get a, when you have a victim of domestic violence or sexual assault, the first person that you are going to encounter, how do you deal with the victim? What question that you need to ask the victim? How do you prepare the victim for what's going to come next? Mm -hmm. So there will be two people, one from Bark, and there will be somebody a, from Brigham and Women that will be coming and talk about that workshop. The fourth workshop that we got is going to be on barrier intervention. 
So we know when we have domestic violence, we have defended. So what's in their mind? How do they operate? How do we stop them? And how to, for them not to manipulate, to manipulate the system? Mm -hmm. So there will be two people from Common Purpose that will be coming and do a workshop on barrier intervention. Okay, and what about the, the other uh, event that you're having? The other event is our annual gala, because AFAB is celebrating uh, its 30th anniversary. So AFAB has been in existence for 30 years. Mm -hmm. So we are going to have a big event on November 20th. It's going to be a Cedars Hall in Jimmy Kaplan. It's starting at 7, 7 p.m. to mm -hmm. 1. And we'll have a fashion show, we'll have a raffle, we have a, a keynote speaker. There will be dancing, there will be Haitian food, great, a lot of parking, and to, people have a chance to networking. Mm -hmm. yeah, because 30, 30 years is not 30 months or 30 days. And if they want more information on how to purchase the tickets, where can they go? The tickets are $75 one. Mm -hmm. And they can call AFAB at 617-287-0096. Or they can stop by at our uh, office at 330 Fuller Street in Dorchester. Or they can go to our website. We got an Eventbrite. They can go to the Eventbrite and, and purchase the, 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 the ticket. Tickets, yeah. And our website is www.afab-kafam, kafam is K-A-F-A-N-M, dot org. I'm hoping to see everyone there who are interested in domestic violence and how to be um, part of AFAB so that they can help their community move forward from domestic violence. Um, if you have any questions for Carmel, she provided you your information. Feel free to call because you're always available. But the organiz the office closes on Friday. We close on Friday, but we open on Saturday. We open from 10 to 6, from Monday to Thursdays. We close on Friday, but we open on Saturdays from 10 to 6. Thank you, Carmel, very much for coming in today. We appreciate all the information. This definitely won't be your last time. You'll definitely be here with us again, um, especially in October. Yeah. We're going to collaborate with each other to, to have a uh, more of a domestic violence forums where we can have different organizations, mm -hmm. um, different shelters to come in and talk about um, this thing called domestic violence. And I also would like to thank my viewers and my listeners um, for supporting me just for tuning in the, into uh, Voice of Reason Boston, um, WEZE 590. Uh, without you, this would not be possible. Again, I'm going to try my best to continue to share the information that I know in our community so we can move forward. Um, once we have, when we have platforms, it, it is up to us to make the change and to help the next person in our community to move forward. Thank you for tuning in. Hope to see you next Saturday.